Okay. Well, you know what they say, the golden rule, it's okay to have a three-way chess call as long as there's some chess in the middle, there's some leeway. So I got John Urschel and Robert Hess with me here, getting ready to have our first um, threesome, uh, if you will. And <laughs> I should probably not record that, but, uh, but it's too late because it's happening. And right now we're live and we're going to analyze exactly what's happening on the board with Grandmaster John Urschel, uh, that's what I want to call you when I watch you play chess, uh, and uh, Grandmaster Robert Hess, who has, who has been instrumental in helping Mr. Urschel improve his game, and, and I think John is paying him in NFL paraphernalia, as you can see from what, from what Robert's wearing. So, uh, Well, here's the deal, guys. We're Tarantinoing this once again. This is the current position with Urschel on the clock, debating whether or not he should be simplifying into an end game uh, even even further perhaps the rook and knight will have an easier time winning against the king and rook as long as there isn't some sort of weird blockade or debating on keeping the bishop but um, before we analyze the position i just want to remind everybody how we got here i mean uh, where we left off john right we were looking at rook b6 anticipating rook e8 we had calculated in the last video that bishop h3 would be a logical follow-up to sort of force the question to black. Do you want to let me in on the light squares, or do you want to give me the dark squares? Uh, black chose to give us the dark squares, and you, you, you didn't think twice about it. You grabbed, you made a grip, right? Took control over these, over these critical squares. You're like a tiger. And, uh, and then you relocated this knight. I was a little bit questioning your decision not to eliminate the knight immediately, uh, given how strong this, this pony looked here, but you chose a plan to bring the knight to a potentially even more lethal square on g5, where we have pressure on e6, maybe potential threats of a mating net against the king. And this is where we stand, and I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to you guys and tell me, I mean, how much longer is the world going to survive against you? Sure. It's on you, buddy. Well, here's what I'm saying. Right now, we're at a very decisive moment. Pretty much what we're looking at is, are we trying to reduce, get the bishop and the pony off the board, or are we trying to keep pressure? So we can check on g4, and that's a plan that we need to look at. Another plan, a plan which I'm very fond of, is bishop g2. Okay. With ideas of going to d5. Okay, so the risk, obviously, of keeping the knight on the board would not be that big of a deal if you can win this pawn outright. Yeah, exactly. But what do, what do you anticipate black would play against that? Well, black can try things like knight e3. Okay. Bobby, what do you got? You've been so quiet. This isn't like you. No, you, you, you know, I'm just trying to let the uh, student figure things out by himself. And right. well, actually one realization that John had was the bishop on g2 might be better placed than on f1 because black, right. of course, would be trying to get the knights at d5. But what I'm thinking here is that if we can dislodge that rook from e8 with a move like, let's say, bishop to c6, right, uh -huh. we can get after that e6 pawn. It's going to become quite difficult for black to continue uh, the defense of the pawn. So John's idea makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, and then if well, rook goes to, like, e7... Uh -huh. Have ideas like bishop d7. Well, Ooh. getting tricky. Real tricky. Look at John busting out the tactics. Somebody's been on tactics trainer. Oh yeah. Um, well, okay. So make my way. <laughs> the only issue is that as fancy schmancy as that looks, the simplification may not be exactly what the doctor ordered, right? Because yeah. I definitely agree with you, Doctor Danny. But this is yeah. one thing that I can trying to teach John is when you have a plan and your opponent doesn't have any sort of active counterplay, you do not hurry. So instead of going bishop d7 immediately, perhaps a waiting move like king to f2 or uh -huh. you know, rook to a6 even to get away ah. from knight d5, right? You can go bishop d7 next move if you want, but king right. f2 hits the knight already on the spot. Ah. To, to show all the fans at home, I think the main reason is that, okay, so to point out the obvious, the rook can't take the bishop everybody because this would be... Chekalina La Shlamba, as we like to say, that's that's Red Rover, and uh, but but okay, as Robert was saying, it is as fancy as it looks. It's probably a little premature after knight to d5 because if we can't if we can't take on e6 and and happily head to this end game, then there's really no point in doing the tactic, right? We really don't want the f4 pawn to fall 
Um, and it is, I think it's a good psychological lesson, Robert, both your, your very instructional point that, okay, if you recognize an idea, you don't have to rush for it right away, right? You can take your time, uh, you know, look for ways to stop your opponent's uh, threats. But also, it's really important not to fall in the trap whenever we're winning, to start looking at lines, just assuming that they're going to work for us, because we have this sort of preconceived notion that, okay, I'm better. It's only a matter of time before there's a winning combination, right? So then we start looking at those combinations, and we just expect that they're going to work, so that, that allows us to miss our opponent's chance, right? Mm -hmm. um, prophylaxis is, is of the highest uh, it's needed when, at the most when, when you're winning. You really have to be on your, on your toes to not let your opponents get back in the game. So I love this idea. I, I still don't think I like this whole plan as much as just simplifying. But um, obviously John's the one who gets to make the final decision. The more I look at this, may, maybe it's harder. Maybe this is harder for black to defend than I'm thinking. I mean, so knight to c4, rook to a6, and, and uh, white, has, white has threats of both bishop d5 and bishop d7. Um, knight to g4 is a check, but but that's all it is, right? King to g3, and and then what? So what what is going? On? So you really like this idea, of bishop g2, more than the the simplification. Well, Robert, give us your grandmaster opinion here. So, what would be your approach? What would be your approach here from like a like a bigger picture perspective, like if you're calculating bishop takes g4, what would you want to see about your plan before you would go for that, before you would be willing to change the position that significantly and eliminate that knight? What would be the things you would want to look for that John can... can, can uh... Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. It's actually something that John was discussing with me yesterday. And again, I don't tell him things like just try to draw it out of him. And one thing that he was saying was that if we take on g4, let's say bishop takes g4, and for example, f takes g4. That looks better in the current position, even though generally we like to take our pawns from the outside towards the center. Here, f right. takes makes more sense to give the king some space. Um, John was saying his first question was, is this winning? If let's say we trade the rooks and the f pawn for the e pawn, is that resulting ending knight and h pawn versus those three pawns? Is it winning? And we had a very he said hard. It's not. Yeah, in the current situation, it didn't feel like this configuration is good enough for white because the knight is actually misplaced on g5 and you can't really reroute it for fear of black playing g5 and trading off that last pawn. Right. And so if instead white is able to trade the rooks and take the g7 pawn and trade the f4 pawn for the e6 pawn, then it is winning yes. because right. there's only this h5 pawn as a target and you can't protect it by leaving a pawn on g6. So that's the mm -hmm. first kind of conceptual idea I would come up with as if we simplify once, does further simplification lead us to the win we want? So now after fg4, we realize that, okay, we don't just want to trade off the rooks right now because the resulting endgame isn't so won. And we also don't want to allow black to get that king you know, to f5 and attack f4, even though right. we can get our king in the center. So one idea that pops to mind here is let's say I go knight e4 check, right? It immediately stops the king from going to f5 because I have a d6, uh, as you might say, a forkalina lishlamba. Well, no, I would just call it a devious fork. Wow, I mean, that was ridiculous. I would never say that. Go ahead. <laughs> And if you go and move like king to g6, well, maybe I can just sit my knight on g3, hitting h5, covering the f5 square. I'm actually threatening f5 check right away. Mm -hmm. So it covers the black's king's entrance. It also is an attacking move at the same time. And it's hard to come up with an idea for black. It's very difficult to see black coming up with anything that would stop an immediate just king, king march, right? Right. Okay. I'm just listening. What else? I... I, I uh... I agree. I want to point out for everyone at home the reason why h takes g4 is not really an option, um, in addition to the fact that I think that f takes g4 makes sense because of the counterplay it opens up, as Robert said, is that um, an immediate move like h5 might really just be lights out. Uh, black, is, black is almost in Zugzwang. Moving the rook anywhere off the e-file is, is still checkmate. Um, pushing g6 might lose to both takes or even just h6. Yeah, h6 and h7. So black black is running out of moves, which is why F takes G four is less of an option, more of a forced uh, recapture. Um, but yeah, this relocation of the knight is really nice because it, it's it's nice when tactical resources justify like our positional goals, right, Robert? Like you you mentioned, the goal is okay. You wouldn't want to simplify an endgame, 
And we talked about this in our last video lesson, right, John? Like, you sh when you're the dictator, when you're in charge, yep. you should never be changing the nature of the position unless you're sure, right? Unless you're, because you don't have to, because you're in charge of the position. So don't, you know, you know, play fiddle diddle, right? I mean, play tickle for, for an hour before you change the position. I mean, so, I mean, I don't want to get weird with you guys sitting on the couch together, but um, no, I mean, seriously, you don't, you shouldn't do anything that doesn't clearly improve your position when you're in charge, but but when you can have, but, but when you can calculate tactics to justify your positional end, usually that's a sign of good things. Like that's like Bod Vinick saying, right? Tactics are the servant of strategy. So if they're working for you, that's a good sign. So if white could establish some sort of just positional bind where black really has nothing to do to prevent an easy road in, that's why I kind of like the idea of taking. Because to me, the advantage of simplifying over any other nice idea is always, okay, well, if I know I'm winning and I've calculated a clear plan, then then simplifying has to be on the top of my list. It just takes away the chances of things getting weird at any time, right? Um, right. But okay, John, I mean, it's up to you. So tell us more. What do you think about this? And what did you think of the lines we've showed so far? You talking to me? I'm talking to you, buddy. All right. Yeah. Can we look at this end position that we got to here? Okay. And just, I know this looks like winning as winning gets, but like, let's just think about it for a second. Mainly let me think about it for like. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll fill in the space while we let John talk. And I think some of his hesitation, which makes sense, especially with such a mathematical mind like John, is that when trading off and simplifying, I don't think he saw the exact winning plan, right? Like there was no straightforward 10 move calculation that said, okay, I move here, my, the, the world moves here, I move here, and now I see the, the clear path to victory. So, of course, that's going to make uh, any player hesitate before trading off pieces because while right. we do like to simplify if we're far ahead, simplification also can end up being uh, more likely for our opponents to draw. As the fewer pawns that are left, the you know, more chances our opponents have to survive. And in a position like this, if you know, the tactics didn't work and the knight's not coming back, or even, you know, Danny, you know, you can move the king into the center without moving the knight. Um, there are, could be some potential problems where maybe black gets a lot of checks, and the, you know, the, we have to stick in front of that g pawn that's a passed pawn. So it's not uh, the simplest thing in the world. Of course, there right. are you know much simpler endings at play, but black does have their own assortment of weaknesses that they need to cover as well. So the, you know, with black having tied down just the e6 pawn, the h5 pawn, okay, I'm ready. It might let white go, and it looks like okay. John's ready. So <laughs> I'm looking at this, and yeah, it looks good, but I'm still uncertain after, uh, so yeah, if they keep the position as is, they're in trouble, we bring our king over, but I'm looking at things like king f7, giving up, we take on h5, we activate our king, yeah, okay, I like it, <laughs> yep. I've well, I mean, I actually, that's not a bad line to point out. If king f7, knight takes h5, can you, you can see that there may be a, a little bit of a shot there for black, like, like rook h8. Okay, there's a whole lot to look at. There's rook b7 check for white there. Um, but it looks like black is going to find a way to get the h4 pawn. Yeah. Um, you know, probably there's a number of roads that lead to Rome here, but you should be, has and you should want to calculate it, as Robert said, and you should want to be sure because, yeah, the more, you know, at this point, black is willing to lose all four of these pawns yeah. for just these two, right? That's all he wants. If he finds a way to do that, so, so that's, you know, it's like... Um, you know your opponent. Your opponent's defensive options are, are are numerous because he's willing to lose the house as long as he gets something, right? So you do have to be really accurate and concrete. Uh, but again, I mean, we look at the position and like, what does he do? I mean, let's just point out that like a move that waits. Um, you know, the simplified road is probably. I mean, I don't even know. I mean, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Just take. Yeah. For sure. I mean, g five can be met by ninety four. Oops. Uh, rook takes. You know, we we. Tr even if you didn't win both these pawns at once, it's still a win. Um, King of seven seems like the most devious idea to me. So if we take a look at it, uh, you know, it does look like he he's getting some 
you know, we we have some okay, some things he, to worry about here, possibly. Why why is he shaking his head? Hold on, <laughs> hold on. He's shaking his head. Why is he shaking his head? Yeah, he's not on our team. He's only an advisor, so he's not allowed to tell us the answer. Oh, some, hold on. He's, I, like I said, I, I let I let John figure hold it out on. himself. I'm not. We're not. Hold on. <laughs> Sixty-four. It's a great number. It is All a right. great number. It's great. Need, Purple's a great color. Too. I need sixty more seconds. Sixty okay. more. <laughs> Why not sixty-four? Yeah. 64. Perfect. Yeah. That gives me an additional. All right, stop one. talking to me. I, I, I need more time. Are you going to be dead silent? You can talk to Danny. Dead yeah. silence. A horror film. You like horror films. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, I'll, so you know. If, it just kind of goes on the same principle of not hurrying. That's well, one idea I have um, is a it follows that principle. But also, um, you know, we, we've been making a, a couple of knee-jerk reactions, which I think we have to consider a little more deeply. Of course, after Knight takes H5, here we sit with Rook H8. We see our Knights under attack. Our pawn on H4 is sitting behind that Knight, and we, again, we don't want to trade too many pawns. Um, right. But I think, you know, if we we look and really consider our options as John is doing right now. Well, we say maybe it's uh, it's not as easy as it might appear, but I'm not going to give any more away than that. Right. I want John. Yeah, I, I think I, I think I understand too. I'm also going to let John. I think I think that this position. Yeah. So um, now we have uh, now we have John just like you know totally under the gun. I love it. And look how serious he is. And look at look at that. No. It was so serious. That strength. He's trying a lot to test that muscular strength in the chest <laughs> right now. And no, trust me, like... he, he showed me how to get out of a chokehold, and feeling being in a chokehold from John Urschel is not something anyone wants to experience. No, it's not on the top of people's list no. of things to experience. I get it. <laughs> um. Okay. So, what I see... What do you see, John? Is uh, he's just crunching numbers real quick? He'll get back to the chest. Yeah, he's like he's making sure he remembers to carry the five. <laughs> you know, <laughs> always forget to carry the five. You know, that's about my level of math understanding. Hashtag long division. <laughs> Watch your language. Oh, <laughs> I get with Hess, and I just yeah, I've been, I've been really getting under his skin all weekend. It's been a it's been a fun time. Uh... Chess, what an evil game. I don't I don't see it. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, th I think um, what, what Robert was kind of touching on is, like, it's really easy to get caught up in, like, the forced lines and, and like, kind of the, the heat of the moment, yeah. as they say. Get caught up in the heat of the moment. But there's actually a very simple move here for White that I think Robert is referring to. Just the move, the move Rook B5 just holds everything, right? It guards the knight. Uh, and, and the main point is that, Black's only goal, Black's only way to kick the knight would be to commit the pawn to g6. Well, now the king no longer has the escape square needed, so a move like rook to b7 check would be pretty devastating. Right, of course. Um, is this the line you were looking at, Robert? Yeah, definitely. And, and another thing to note is, I mean, this is clearly great for white. And even if black makes a waiting move instead of g6, like rook h6, it doesn't actually right. help at all. Now white can bring the king up. And as soon as you go right. g6 for black, then I still give you the check, and right. all of a sudden your pawns are all falling. But... The broader point is if you don't find a move like rook b5 and you go back before knight takes h5, and it's something that I always tell uh, people who are trying to improve, is that, well, do I even have to take on h5 right now? That pawn's just sitting there. Can I just right. instead make a move like king to f2? Because it's not totally. like black really wants to go e5 himself, right? The world doesn't want to make a move like that because then I, it, I'm cutting off the uh, yep. sixth rank. I'll just go f5, for example, and now I'm, it's much harder to start trading pawns. No, you're right. I mean, even if Black achieves what his apparent goal of that idea, solidifying, I mean, you're, you're headed to a position where it's getting harder and harder to want to be Black, right? Right. And, John, you and I talked about this a little, like, what Robert, and Robert's a great endgame player. A lot of people don't know that. I don't have any reason to compliment Robert. I rarely do it. Those know. But, no, Robert is actually an exceptionally 
mature endgame player as for like a young grandmaster and that's been one of his strengths and so i can say that like the advice of recognizing what you do and don't have to do especially when you're in control of the position i mean that's like really the sign of someone with good technique and like we talk about the karpov principle remember that john like yeah. you want to be a boa constrictor i mean by the time you take your opponent's weak pawns you want them begging for mercy like you want them begging for like a quick end like they want you to take the pawns because they can't take it anymore you know, you don't ever want to go for a situation where there's a potential for counterplay. Now, that said, knight takes h5, if you had calculated it accurately, might be something that works because of a, a cute little sort of, you know, it's, it's, it is sort of counterintuitive, but it's a very simple way to hold the position. But yeah, I mean, so the more we look at this, the more we just, I don't even know how the world, I think, I think you're, you're choosing between pretty good options. Obviously, I think that it seems like Robert and I are a little bit biased toward you know, the matter of, you know, good Russian schoolboy technique. If we're calculating something that, you know, puts our opponent under more pressure, we don't see, we see multiple ways for the road to continue after easy simplification. I mean, we're biased, but I don't think that, I, I don't think that you can go wrong with continuing to sit on a position where your opponent is about one move away from blundering. You know, I mean, any, any bad move here, Black might get himself checkmated. So it's easy to want to also, you know, just kind of improve this piece if you decide not to take it. Um... You know, can I just say real quick, I'm just real proud of you, John. Can I just say that we've come a long way, yeah. you know? I mean, seriously, I think that you're going you're gonna to be the first ever amateur. I hold up the Dr. Evil fingers, you know, not to insult you, but I mean, you're, I don't know if you caught the memo, but you're a professional football player. You're not a professional <laughs> chess player. So, I mean, this is, this is amazing. You've, you, you've really played some high-quality, disciplined chess. I like to think that your coaching has helped. <laughs> Um, and, you know, don't let your guard up because there are still potential tricks, right? You know your opponent is, you know, you, you have a, you have a, you have a, you're backing a wild animal into a corner, right? That's what I always used to tell my students when they're winning a position, Robert, where their opponent is completely lost. Yeah. Is like the only way you blow this is by forgetting that you're backing a wild animal into a corner. You're in control, but they're going to look for every way possible to just give up everything to, to swindle their way into a draw. So you can't miss tactical tricks. That's and the gonna, only way you blow this position at this point. Absolutely. I'm going to give a rare compliment to my buddy John over here. Two things. One, he did an excellent job yesterday in Union Square beating one of the chess players there. He just ground him down. It was a phenomenal Urshe Urshelian performance. Urshelian. But two, I think John does have um, you know, his suggestion with Bishop G2. It makes a lot of sense, and it's a kind of great practical advice for a lot of players that if you don't see after the clear simplification you know, that there is a – clear path to achieve a greater advantage, perhaps not simplifying and milking and nursing that edge is a great strategy. It's not like black really has many active options as we were discussing earlier. So I think, you know, right. admittedly, John didn't, might not have seen this 94 check after bishop g4, fg4, 94 check. So, you know, I, I'm not seeing that, I'm not feeling as much. So I'm gonna keep this bishop, which has promise in the position to attack e6. I think John very much recognized that's a vital weakness. And if right. the bishop makes it easier to get to e6, well, maybe that's a plus. So I think there is a, it's a great line of thinking if you don't see how simplification leads to a more direct edge. Yeah. The are, are, you, are you saying that because he gave you the jersey? I didn't see that. Uh, no, I said that actually before I ever saw <laughs> No, I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. John, go ahead. What were you going to say, bud? Yeah, I was going to say uh, when I looked at bishop takes, f takes g4, knight e4 is not a move that I saw. And that's a... Uh, that is that's like a key move in this structure. Right, it's definitely a move that because you you talked about how you and Hess were calculating the position. I don't know if you guys were at lunch or something in your head, right? You said you were talking about it, yeah. and there was that there was. I like your abilities, John, or the the thing you do where you try to ask yourself the bigger picture. Okay, if I took these things off the board, would the end game be winning or not? Those are really good questions, and even though sometimes they seem like you know we're playing imaginary house. Those are the things you have to ask yourself so that you feel like, you know, you know where you're trying to steer the ship. Right. Um, and I think in calculating that and not being sure that that endgame was winning, you guys touched on the fact that if this knight ever leaves g5, there's potential trades. Also, the king is sort of hampered in a lot of those lines because this is a protected passer. So if you're looking at that endgame and you don't see a tactical, like, concrete follow-up, it is very risky. Um, you know, maybe there's some winning lines. Like, I think we, you know, we talked about, you know, even if you get a position like this, maybe there, maybe this is even a win, but why, why go for it, right? If you're not confident that you can restrict this sort of simplification and aggressive approach by your opponent, that would be exactly the kind of line that would make you not want to take on G4. 
So you're absolutely right. And I think that um, I'll, re I'll just remind you one more time of something I said, I think it was the second video, but because we've been talking about this whole theme of what are the bigger picture things to think about to keep ourselves disciplined for all those at home, right? How do we consistently convert on our advantages, which should be the one muscle you work on all the time, right, Robert? It's the one that you can control as a chess player. Sometimes you can't control that you sit down and Bobby Hess is just better than you if you're me, right? But you can control that when you're winning, you have to win those games and you have to have the good principles of technique. And a big part of that is just not giving your opponent unnecessary chances, not simplifying too quickly, just assuming the game is going to win itself, right? And also, when you calculate, you know, you have to do what you're doing. You want to make the tactics work for you. Remember, I gave you the Tim Gunn line, but I watched Project Runway with the wife. I'm tortured. You guys aren't, you guys aren't there yet in your <laughs> life, you know? But, um, you know, it, you want to make it work. And if you can calculate a way to make tactics justify your positional means, that's a very good sign. And that's what Robert was able to do with this kind of line and, you know, where we went in for that. But again, I think that as long as you stay on your toes, we're gonna, I feel like we're like, I feel like we're releasing a baby bird into the wild, Robert, a very, very large baby bird, a very, <laughs> a very strong baby bird. <laughs> I mean, I think it's like a cub, you know, he's, a, he's like a bear over here. Yeah, like a big a big bear. We're letting him go. I mean, John, John. I mean, we're gonna have at least one more video once this thing is over. But if it gets if it gets messy, we'll do it again. But I feel like at this point, you're gonna have to exercise. You know, flex those muscles. The the muscles in the head, not not the muscles, not the biceps. <laughs> All right. Anything more, guys? Do we want me to make any more awkward jokes? That was enough right there. Just that look. That look just said it. You guys just looked into each other's eyes, and, and that's all the crowd needs to see. So <laughs> thanks for being here, and uh, we look forward to seeing how John finishes the game. I'll re remind everybody, there's a link. If you still want to go, check it out on chess.com and join Team World as you guys lose to the, to the baby cub that we're releasing into the wild. But uh, have fun. Thank you, everybody, for watching these videos, and uh, we'll, look, we'll see you at least one more time when the game's over, if not another time.